Hi, ladies. Well, I'm um, kind of sad that I don't get to see you in front of me, but the gentlemen here have been kind enough to allow me to record the last two teachings of Ruth. So that's what we're going to do this morning or this afternoon. So hopefully you got your Bibles. We're going to start in Ruth chapter 3. Uh, if you remember, we uh, left off at the end of chapter 2 and things were about to turn around for Ruth and Naomi. It turns out, if you remember, that the field that Ruth had chosen to work in, to glean in, belonged to a man named Boaz, and that he is a close relative of Laomi's late husband, Elimelech, and as such, we find out that he has the right of redemption. Well, we talked a little bit about redemption last time as well, and it means that we are to buy back or that somebody buys back something that previously belonged to them or that they had a right to. And remember the example we gave of the boy and and his boat. Well, the analogy of that story is that we are God's two times, first by creation and secondly through redemption. The sacrifice of Jesus on the cross bought us back and brought us back into the fold and into the family of God. If you'll remember correctly, we also quoted Leviticus 25 verse 23, where God's people were given the right of redemption. Uh, that means that if they were going through difficult financial times and they had to sell a portion of their land or even sell themselves, into uh, indentured servitude that at some point, at a certain period of time, they had the right of redemption, which means they could purchase the land. Or if they were unable to pay the price that was required, they enlisted the help of a close relative to help them redeem their land or their freedom. And that person was known as the kinsman redeemer. Well, the kinsman redeemer had to have two qualities at least. One, he needed to be a close relative. And two, he needed to have the resources of redemption. And in Ruth, we find that Boaz has both. If you'll also remember, there was another law of redemption. It was in effect in her here also, and it is found in Deuteronomy 25, 5. It is called the Leverite marriage uh, law or redemption that comes from the word, uh, a Latin word for brother-in-law. Uh, when brothers live together, it says, and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the deceased shall not be married outside the family to a strange man. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her to himself as wife and perform the duty of the husband's brother to her. And it shall be that the firstborn whom she bears shall assume the name of his dead brother so that his name will not be blotted out from Israel. I'm going to go on and finish this verse. But if the man does not desire to take his brother's wife, then his brother's wife shall go to the elders and say, my husband's brother refuses to establish a name for his brother in Israel. He is not willing to perform the duty of a husband's brother to me. And at this point, then the elders of the city would all come together. They tried to speak to him. They tried to convince him to change his mind. But if he persisted in not wanting to take her as his wife, then it says the woman shall come in the sight of the elders, pull off the sandal of his foot, spit in his face, and she shall declare, thus it is done to the man who does not build up his brother's house in Israel. His name shall be called the house of him whose sandal is removed. Now, I know this all sounds really strange to us. I mean, um, my husband has four other brothers, and I can tell you if anything happened to Doug, I'm not real keen on marrying any of the other four of those brothers, though they're very nice men. Uh, but we have to try not to Americanize scripture. Um, I know it sounds strange. Remember that the intermarrying of families uh, was and is still commonplace in parts of the Middle East and in tribal communities in other parts of the world. Uh, remember, Abraham in the Bible was actually married to his half-sister. Well, the people of this time and of this culture were tribal. Uh, therefore, when they sought a husband or a wife for their child, they looked to choose somebody within their tribe or their extended family. Um, let's remember that culturally, the most important thing a woman could do at this time was to give birth to a son and to carry on the husband's name and the family line. And that way his land remained intact within the family. Um, if a single brother or if a family member was not willing to then take on the widowed wife, uh, which was his right, he would be publicly disgraced for not doing it. And the widow then had the right to complain to the elders and publicly insult the man, taking off his shoe and spitting in his face. Um, it was an insult not only to the widow, but also to the deceased family member. Well, recalling this right of redemption, those two acts of the right of redemption, uh, Naomi begins to form a plan regarding Ruth's future. 
uh, beginning in chapter three, verse one, it says, then Naomi, her mother-in-law said to her, my daughter, shall I not seek security for you that it may be well with you? Um, well, last time we met, we also talked about something called mutual submission. Um, scripture tells us that as God's people, we are to live in mutual submission to one another. A couple of verses, Galatians 6, 2 says, carry one another's burdens and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Philippians 2, 2 and 4, uh, very familiar to us. Paul writes, make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being united in spirit and purpose, and do nothing out of selfish ambition or empty conceit, but in humility, consider one another as more important than yourselves. Each of you look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. And that was the way Naomi and Ruth um, seemed to have this symbiotic mutual submission relationship. Well, because of this, Naomi has a plan. Um, it, well, and, and I'll go on a little bit. The life of Christ we know is lived out in our love for others. And the love is manifested in the way we treat others, uh, care for others, and the practical way we care for their concerns. Well, Naomi and Ruth are this beautiful um, example of mutual submission. Uh, Naomi has Ruth's best interest in mind, and she wants to see Ruth settled and secure. Uh, she wants Ruth to have a husband, a home. She wants her to have a family. And if that should bring a few grandchildren Naomi's way, then more's the blessing for all. That's Naomi's mindset. Well, Naomi then tells Ruth, what she's been thinking in verse two. Now is not Boaz our kinsman with whom whose maids you were? Behold, he winnows barley at the threshing floor tonight. Wash yourself therefore and anoint yourself and put on your best clothes and go down to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. It shall be when he lies down that you shall go and uncover his feet and lie down, and then he will tell you what you shall do. Now just a side note, a threshing floor is a place where the chaff was separated from the grain. Remember, Ruth was gleaning from the field, and so the threshing floor was where they separated the kernel uh, from the stuff that was useless, the husk. Um, the chaff was the husk or the part of the stock that just wasn't usable. Well, knowing that Boaz was going to be with his men at the threshing floor uh, this evening, Naomi tells Ruth, uh, wash up, put on a little perfume, and get dressed in your nicest clothes. Uh, in other words, she says, gussy up, girl, because we're going man catching. Uh, that is my paraphrase. Well, having been married, Naomi having been married for several years and raising two adult sons, I'm sure she has some valuable advice to offer Ruth about men. Myself having been married for 25 years and raising a son, uh, I wish I knew then a little of what I know now. First, this is one of the things, I'm gonna take a little side view here. One of the things you need to understand is men are attracted by the physical. Now, we can fight that as much as we want to, ladies, but it is the cold, hard facts. Ruth is probably a pretty young woman. Uh, Naomi senses that Boaz is already interested, but she wants Ruth to look and smell her best. She wants her pretty, perfumed, and she wants her pleasant and heading down to the threshing floor. Second, Naomi also knows something, a little bit of something about men and timing. She tells Ruth to wait until they have eaten and had a little to drink, telling Ruth to go to him when he's relaxed and happy, then you're going to find a better reception. I think those are wise words. And I'm gonna take a little detour on this topic uh, for those of us who are wives or any woman here who might be involved in a relationship. Uh, here is groundbreaking news, and you're gonna to wanna to write, this, write this down from a woman who's been married for 25 years, ready? Men and women are different, yes? I know our culture tells us that there is absolutely no difference except what we cultivate into our children, but we know that that just is not the case. I can tell you after working with children for over 20 years uh, that boys and girls come from the womb hardwired, created by God to be different, equal but different. One is not better than the other. We are created to be different so that we can complement one another and we can help one another. Uh, I go back to the Garden of Eden. When God created man first, he gave him a job to do. But after, after watching Adam for a little while, uh, God decided, well, uh, it's not good for man to be alone. He needs a helper. So uh, we were created by God to be helpmates for our husbands. 
But I love the line from the movie, My Big Fat Greek Wedding, if you've ever seen it. Um, not scripture, but I like it. I think it's wisdom anyway. You may remember it. The Greek husband and father says to his family, I am the head of this family. And his wife says, yes, but I am the neck that turns the head. And I think that's sage advice. As wives and as wise women, we need to be prayerful when it comes to how and when we address certain situations with our husbands and also with others. If you've ever read the story of Abigail, you'll find that in 1 Samuel 25, and I can't go into that for time's sake, but Abigail is a wise woman married to a foolish man called Nabal. And Abigail shows great wisdom before confronting her husband about a very important matter. They had almost lost their household to the wrath of David on the warpath. She comes home and she sees him that he's drunk. And this is not a good time con to confront him, as angry as she probably was. Um, she waited until an opportune moment. Well, whenever we have something of importance to say to someone, whether it's our husbands, co-workers, or our bosses, or even friends, we need to be very prayerful about how and when we say it. I find this especially true when it comes to confronting someone else. If God wants you to say or do something difficult, then ask him to open up a door of opportunity, and in the meantime, be prayerful over it. Well, Naomi then tells Ruth in verse four, it shall be when he lies down that you shall notice the place where he lies and you shall go and uncover his feet and lie down and then he will tell you what you shall do. Okay, so I find this to be, as probably you do too, some very interesting advice. I don't, I don't know about you, but I would have had some questions for Naomi if I were Ruth, like, um, is this cult customary for you people? Um, won't he think I'm being a little forward? Uh, what will other people there think about me? And how is all this supposed to work? I'd be very curious if I was Ruth. Um, instead, how does Ruth respond? Well, we see that in verse five. She says to Naomi, all that you say, I will do. Well, don't we all want a daughter or a daughter-in-law that is like that? I know I do. Well, Ruth trusts Naomi because Naomi cares for Ruth and she knows that. We read no questions. We sense no fear. Just the beautiful obedience of a girl who trusts in the loving care of her mother-in-law. Verse 6 says, so she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law had commanded her. It's evening, and the workers are probably finishing up their work before darkness sets in. One senses that it's a joyful time of peace and perhaps just some male bonding going on. They share some laughter, a little conversation, a meal, and probably a little wine. And after a hard, hard day's work, they settle in for some sleep. I do love that Boaz is here among his people. He appears to find joy in the work and in the company of those who work for him. I sense that type of love and camaraderie in the ministry of Jesus whenever I read the Gospels. Whether it was fishing, teaching, or just talking, Jesus loved to be out and about and among his people. Well, as Boaz settles in for the night, Ruth comes quietly into the area where he is sleeping. Verse 7, when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain, and Ruth came secretly and uncovered his feet and lay down. She has no idea how she's going to be received. She's coming into the company of a group of men at nighttime. She then finds Boaz, that had to be difficult enough as it was, and she uncovers his feet and lays down there. What if he's angry when he wakes up? What if he's insulted? What if he thinks less of her? She is putting her reputation at risk. Remember, this is not a customary practice. How easily all of this could have been misconstrued or misunderstood by others. There are even commentators today, as I was looking through and studying this passage of scripture, who believe that something sexual happened here. To them, I quote Titus 1.15, to the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, both their mind and their conscience are defiled. The Bible holds Ruth up as an example of loving obedience. She was a woman of faith. She knew that Naomi loved her, and because of that, Ruth trusted that she knew what was best for her. And that is how she found the courage to do what she was asked. Would Naomi, being a loving guardian, send Ruth into a dangerous situation? Or would she risk ruining her daughter-in-law's chances for a good marriage by risking her reputation? 
See, Naomi understood something about the character of Boaz. Perhaps she had asked her around town, we don't know. But Ruth is not to be condemned for her actions. She is to be commended. Anyone who walks with God long enough discovers that there is often a fine line between faith and foolishness. What can look foolish in the eyes of the unbelieving can be the very thing that God uses to prove his faithfulness to us. You know, we have many examples of that in the Bible. Noah spent over a hundred years building a boat where there had not been a drop of rain. Abraham believed that he and his wife would have a son, even after that was physically impossible for Sarah. Gideon was told to reduce his army down to 300 men, and David, as a young boy, took on a nine and a half foot giant. There is a fine line between faith and foolishness, and God may ask us at times to walk that line, to do or say something that doesn't sound wise or reasonable to do. Now, please hear me. That does not mean that every idea that comes into our heads is from God. God is not the author of fear or the author of confusion, but he is the author and the perfecter of our faith. And all faith includes a certain amount of doubt or it wouldn't be called faith. If God is telling you to do something that is contrary to what you know or feel is best, then ask him to confirm that through his word. I have found that his word will always give a principle, a precept, or even a person as an example and a guiding um, standard of what we should do or do not do. Pray and ask God to confirm his instructions to you through his word. Our faith in God and our obedience to God can often be misconstrued or misunderstood by others, even God's own people. I see this in Luke 7, where it says a sinful woman came to the house of a Pharisee where Jesus was dining. She comes to the table where he's reclining and she begins weeping. And it says she wet his feet with her tears and she was wiping them with her hair and kissing his feet. This is a very intimate act. And then it says she broke open a container of perfume and she anointed Jesus' feet with the expensive perfume. Jesus was blessed by this act, praising the woman for her kindness to him. But you remember the response of other people standing nearby. They were less than impressed. The Pharisee, a religious leader, was disgusted. And he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is. Who is touching him? She is a sinner. We see a similar situation in Matthew 26 at the home of Simon. Another woman comes to Jesus with an alabaster vial of very costly perfume, and she pours it on Jesus' head. And it says, when the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste? This perfume might have been sold for a high price and the money given to the poor. Well, Jesus hearing this scolds them. She's done a good deed to me. The poor you have with you, but you do not always have me. And then Jesus goes on to say, truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be spoken of in memory to her. Two groups, two women, two gifts, and yet both women were misunderstood, one by a religious leader and the other by Jesus' own disciples. The fact is, it is very easy to stand on the sidelines and criticize others for their faith. It's a lot harder to step out in faith and to risk being misunderstood or misinterpreted, again, even by God's own people. If we follow God for any length of time, at some point he will ask us to do something that may not make sense to us or to others and that it may appear to be foolish. But our trust in God and our obedience to God is proof that we love him and that we believe in him. We are told this in Hebrews 11:6 that it is impossible to please God for the one who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. We must have the faith to believe in God and to act on those things that may be foolish to others. Ruth trusts Naomi because Ruth believes that Naomi wants what is best for her. In the same way, I know that God loves me. And because he loves me, he wants what is best for me. Just as God loves you and God wants what's best for you. And that mean, may mean exercising faith that looks to others like foolishness. If our eyes are on the Lord and our desire is to please him, then we must let go of what others think about us and choose to live for an audience of one, our Lord, our King. Well, gathering up her courage, Ruth comes secretly to the threshing floor that night. 
And though some may consider Ruth's behavior to be shocking, um, she has been given the right by God himself. This is not presumption. It is believing the word of God and it is acting on it. Hebrews 4.16 tells us that we can draw near to God with confidence. Some interpretations say boldness. We can come boldly to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace in time of need. We have access to God 24 hours a day, seven days a week, whatever the time, whatever the topic, whatever the trouble, and whatever the temptation. And nothing blesses God more than us taking him at his word. You know, whenever I read Hebrews 4.16, I think of John Kennedy and his son, John Jr. Uh, maybe you've seen it. There was a photo of John Jr. that was taken in 1962 of little John hiding under the president's desk in the Oval Office. And apparently it was one of his places to play and to hide. Well, the Oval Office of the White House is the office of the most important man in the world, a place where his father, Jack Kennedy, used to do business with dignitaries. It was a place where very few were allowed free access. But because of his relationship to his father, John Jr. could come boldly into his dad's office as if it were the most natural thing in the world, knowing that his father would welcome him. We too have that kind of access with our Heavenly Father. We don't have to come begging. We don't have to come crawling or cringing. We can come boldly into the throne room of God our King. And we can know that we are going to be admitted and accepted. Because we have access to our Redeemer based on our relationship and the right of redemption. And yet even as Ruth comes boldly to Boaz, she also fully submits herself to his will by laying herself down at his feet. This is what I call bold submission. There is a difference between boldness and arrogance. Coming to God in boldness means we come knowing that we are loved and that we are accepted. Coming to God in arrogance is believing that we are owed something by God. Ruth's behavior is bold, but it is not arrogant. We find that she immediately places herself at Boaz's feet and she waits for him there. Verse 8 says, It happened in the middle of the night that the man was startled and bent forward, and behold, a woman was lying at his feet. I guess that he was startled. I know I'd be startled. Maybe his feet got cold. Maybe he went to roll over and pull up the covers when suddenly he realized there's somebody lying at or on my feet. I think this would startle anyone. Finding Ruth there, he asks, who are you? And Ruth answers, I am Ruth, your maid. So spread your covering over your maid, for you are a close relative. She gets right to the point. She says, I'm Ruth, and I'm here to exercise my right of redemption. Again, I don't think this was a normal practice, even for that day. I don't think that single women went around uncovering men's feet and laying down, waiting for requests. We find no history of it. We find no customs coinciding with this. Desperate times call for desperate measures. And I think that Boaz was genuinely startled to find this young woman lying at his feet in the middle of the night, especially when he was surrounded by a group of sleeping men. But I think that once Boaz realized who it was and why she was there, that he was also quite pleased to find her there. Verse 10 says, Then he said, May you be blessed of the Lord, my daughter. You have shown your last kindness to be better than the first by not going after young men, whether poor or rich. Now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you. You know, Boaz, I want you to notice, too, that Boaz many times refers to Ruth as my daughter. I think this is a loving term of tenderness, a term of endearment, but it's also a term of respect. He never wanted her to think that he had any ulterior or questionable motives where she was concerned. He wants her to know that he cares for her and that she is safe with him, therefore the term daughter. Uh, lest we think that the address of daughter is unusual, remember that as God's people, we are considered to be his children, but we are also considered to be his bride. John 1, 12 and 13 tells us to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of blood, nor of the desire or will of man, but born of God. And also in Ephesians 1, 5, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will. 
We are the sons and daughters of God through spiritual birth and by adoption, but we are also called his bride. Isaiah 54, 5 says, For thy maker is thy husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. 2 Corinthians 11, 2, For I am, a, I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have promised you one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. Every man in the church, as part of the body of Christ, should treat other women respectfully as mothers, as sisters, and as daughters. Only when God reveals that the two are to become husband and wife should that relationship ever change. God is not against romance. Remember, he is the God of romance. The book of Hosea speaks in romantic terms. The book of Song of Solomon is all about the romantic relationship between God and his bride as seen through Solomon and the woman he loves. In fact, it actually even makes you blush to read that book. So remember that Boaz is a type of Jesus in the book of Ruth. He is Ruth's kinsman redeemer, but he is also to be her bridegroom. But Boaz treads lightly upon that path until they have made a commitment to one another. They are to remain respectful to one another. You know, I found this to be a very difficult concept when I became a new believer. Um, well, I came to the Lord in 1992 and I used to date on a regular basis. In fact, my previous impression of Christians was that they were just a group of people who couldn't get dates, so this was their social circle. i uh, tell you how wrong I was. So now I was part of that com uh, community and they didn't do random dating like I had done. And this was brought home to me in an experience I had shortly after I was saved and I started attending the church. I was about 31 years old, youngish, single, and an older man from the church had asked me if I wanted to go uh, to dinner with him. Well, I considered him a friend. I had no romantic interest in him, but I agreed, and we went out together one night and ate Chinese food. Well, upon returning to the church the following week, people were asking me how long we'd been dating. Um, apparently, he told his friends that God told him we were going to be married and that I was going to be the mother to his children. He already had a couple children. I was like, hold on a minute. We just had Chinese food. So the whole thing was moving a little fast for me. I came to realize in the church, you don't go around trying people on. In fact, I found the best way to find a husband or a wife is to allow God to choose the when and the who, when that's going to happen. Um, so I decided at that point to turn my dating life over to God. Uh, this meant that I had to let go of someone I was seeing as a friend um, who had hoped that we would end up getting married. Um, shortly after letting go of that relationship, brought, uh, God brought Doug into my life when I had truly said I was done and I was going to just give this all over to God. Uh, in about 30 days, I met uh, Doug, who became my husband uh, that same year. So there are some things you just have to give over to God, and this is one of them. God knows what and who is best for us. If this is an area that you're struggling in as a single woman, uh, you need to understand God knows, and there is nothing too difficult for God. You may be saying, well, it's been years and I haven't seen anyone. There's no prospects. I just don't see anyone. Um, here, here are some things that I have found that please God in that area while you're single. First, commit this part of your life to the Lord and truly give it over. God knows if you're hanging on to it. Let it go. Put it on the altar and don't take it back. Secondly, serve God where you're at. Single people have an advantage when it comes to serving. They do not have the responsibility of having to think about a spouse. Paul writes about that in 1 Corinthians 7, 8. He says, it is better that you are single. He says, stay, I say to the unmarried and to the widows that it is good for them if they remain, remain even as I, and that's single. And in verse 32 of that same chapter, but I want you to be free from concern. One who is unmarried is concerned about the things of the Lord, how he or she may please the Lord. The woman who is unmarried and the virgin is concerned about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and spirit. But one who is married is concerned about the things of this world, how she may please her husband. This I say for your own benefit, not to put a restraint upon you, but to promote what is appropriate and to secure undistracted devotion to the Lord. There are things that single people can do, places they can go, time that they have that married people cannot and do not. If God wants you to remarry, then let him bring that person into the picture. Remember, God didn't, I mean, Adam didn't see any prospective people. He was all alone. All he'd been doing was counting animals. Um, all he had to do was fall asleep for God to bring him a suitable mate. Rest in the Lord and serve the Lord and leave marriage and matchmaking in his more than capable hands. 
Well, also, as a side note uh, to those of you who might be in the dating realm or seeing somebody, uh, trust in the counsel of those that you love and respect. If you are seeing someone and those closest to you are seeing red flags or warning signs, listen to them and then take these concerns to the Lord. Friends and family members usually have your best interest at heart. Well, Ruth received wise, wise counsel from Naomi and she walked in that counsel. Even though Naomi's advice seemed somewhat unorthodox, Ruth wanted what was best, or Naomi wanted what was best for Ruth. And it wouldn't surprise me if Naomi did a little research on Boaz in the background. He certainly knows a few things about Ruth. Verse 10, then Boaz said, may the Lord bless you, my daughter. You have shown more kindness now than before because you have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. And now do not be afraid, my daughter. I will do for you whatever you request, since all my fellow townspeople know that you are a woman of noble character. Again, I get the impression that Boaz is an older man because he commends her for not going after the younger or richer men of the town. He calls her a woman of excellence. He praises her. She has earned the reputation of being noble, and his praise reminds me of the Proverbs 31 woman. That woman, remember, is commended for her hard work. She is kind. She is compassionate. Says many daughters have done noble things, but you surpassed them all. Charm is deceptive, and beauty is fleeting. But a woman who fears the Lord, she is to be praised. In Ruth, Boaz sees that kind of woman and he feels she is worth having. But there is another who has first claim on her and this must first be dealt with. So Boaz tells Ruth to remain and to rest and that he will take care of things from here. Verse 12, yes, it is true that I am a kinsman redeemer, but there is a redeemer nearer than I. Stay here tonight and in the morning. If he wants to redeem you, good, let him redeem you. But if he does not want to redeem you, as surely as the Lord lives, I will. Now lie here until morning. Ruth isn't fearful and she doesn't panic. Instead, she does just as Boaz instructs her to do. She remains where she is and she rests, trusting that he is going to take care of what needs to be taken care of. We have God's promise on that as well. Matthew 6.33, it's called God's cure for care. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, all these things that we're worried about are going to be taken care of. And don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will worry about itself. Today has enough trouble of its own and we can say amen with everything going on right now. Ruth remained and she rested. She had done all that she could. The situation is now in the capable hands of her kinsman redeemer. Verse 14, so she lay at his feet until morning, but she got up before anyone else could recognize her. And then Boaz said, do not let it be known that a woman came to the threshing floor. And he told her, bring the shawl you are wearing and hold it out. And when she did so, he shoveled six measures of barley into her shawl. And then he went into the city. I love that Boaz is protective of her and her reputation. And he was able and willing to redeem her as she requested. But I also love that before he heads off to deal with the day's dilemma, he wants to bless her. And I love the word. It says, by shoveling six measures of barley into her shawl. That was an abundant blessing. Imagine she's got a shawl and he fills it up with about two and a half gallons of grain. It seems that Boaz cannot help but bless Ruth generously. He fills up her shawl, and I love my Bible translation says that he laid it on her. Boaz was so generous with his blessing that it was almost more than she could carry. I'm reminded of Ephesians 3.20, now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. God is a giver. He doles out blessing with a shovel, not an eyedropper. And God wants to give us more than we can carry. He wants to, like Boaz, lay it on us. So Boaz sends Ruth back to Naomi with tangible proof of his commitment, so much so that she can barely lift it. And after blessing Ruth, Boaz makes a beeline for the city. He has some urgent business to take care of. You get the sense that he is eager to get this situation sorted out. Well, as Boaz rushes to the city gates, Ruth heads home to Naomi with her abundant blessing in tow. Verse 16, when Ruth returned to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked her, how did it go, my daughter? Then Ruth told her that Boaz, what Boaz had done for her. And she said, he gave me these six measures of barley for he said, do not go back to your mother-in-law empty handed. Boaz care extends to Naomi. And I believe that he is also sending her a message. We can see that in the words that Naomi says to Ruth. 
Verse 18 says, wait, my daughter, said Naomi, until you find out how things go, for he will not rest until he has resolved the matter today. Can't you just see Naomi's knowing smile and that little twinkle in her eye? Her gamble has paid off. She now has tangible proof that Boaz loves Ruth and that he's going to do all that he can to redeem the situation for Ruth's advantage. As her redeemer, Boaz is able, and he appears to be more than willing, but he must settle things first. He must be out of the picture for a little while while working all things together for Ruth. Ruth may not know what needs to be done or how things need to be handled, but he has promised that he will take care of things to bring about a good result, and she takes him at his word. This, ladies, is the same with our Redeemer. He knows and he loves us. He knows and wants what is best for us. We also know that he is able, and though we sometimes struggle with the willing part, we can be confident in this, that he, did not, who, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? And I'll close with this. If God is willing, and we know that he is able, then what can stand in his way? Isaiah 14, 24, the Lord of hosts has sworn, surely as I have planned, so will it be. As I have purposed, so will it stand. The Lord of hosts has purpose and who can thwart him? His hand is outstretched, so who can turn it back? Naomi is uh, confident in Boaz's ability because she has seen the evidence of his love for Ruth. And I'm just going to wind it on down here. Because of this, she knows that she is not going to rest. He is not going to rest until this matter is settled. So she instructs Ruth to wait. Waiting is hard. What is usually the first thing we ask when somebody asks us to wait? Our first question is usually, how long? Well, God doesn't answer that question, does he? And what may seem like a short time to God can often stretch on to be a very long time to us. I came to this conclusion when I was studying Genesis 25, where it says Isaac prayed for his wife, Rebecca, because she was barren. And then you have a semicolon, and then it says, and Rebecca conceived. That semicolon represents approximately 17 to 20 years. So I realized that God does not see waiting in the same way I do. It's a blip on a screen for him. If you are waiting on something from the Lord, perhaps it's a promise he has given in his word, then take heart because in his eyes, it's a done deal. But some waiting may be involved. If so, then God has a reason for it. We are then to wait for him, trusting that he is working all things together. He is redeeming the situation and the circumstances in our life for good and for his glory. Ruth is instructed by Naomi to wait, confident that Boaz will resolve this matter. She doesn't need to fret or become frustrated because she knows he is able. He is at work on her behalf, just as God is at work in ours. And I'll close with that. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray for that woman out there who may be experiencing fear. I pray that you would give her peace. For that woman who is waiting, I pray that you would give her patience and the confidence to hope in the Lord, her kinsman redeemer, to know that it is a done deal. If you have promised it, if you have spoken it, if you have ordained it, Lord, it is done. So, Lord, I just pray for each and every woman that might be watching this, each and every person that might be watching this, Lord, that you would reach out and bring comfort and the confidence that you are the Lord, our God, and you have our best interests at heart, Father. And we just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.